What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Ted Jones World Podcast. Guys, today we have a very, very special guest. I don't say this word lightly when I say this, but we have tennis scientist Jack Brody in the building. Jack, how are you, man? I'm great. How are you doing, T-Money? I am great. Jack Brody, a tennis coach of mine for a few years. Nobody knows the game seriously like Jack Brody. You may hear commentators on the, on the tennis channel or whatever say things about the game that just sound very vague, but Jack really gets into the specifics of the game and basically the mathematics on the game. So, Jack, um, why don't you just give us a quick history on how you began you know, your life in tennis? Well, you know, pretty typical probably. My dad was playing at a swimming tennis club and in the summer times. I was actually playing baseball, Little League, and uh, I was about 10 years old, and he's taking a few tennis lessons here, really getting into it because he had dropped golf and wanted to get more exercise. And I just started playing with him a little bit, and then I eventually dropped baseball and just really got into tennis uh, by the time I was 12. And then went full bore after that. But was there, uh, was there anyone that you looked up to that you know really got you to uh, play the game fully, or was it your just your dad mostly? You think? Oh, uh, my dad. You know, the club pro was a real nice guy. His name was uh, was it Peter Chang? Yeah, Peter Chang, nice guy, and and uh, he really uh, you know gave me a lot of encouragement. So I, I I always remember him. He was my first coach and. You know, not much of a coach, particularly, I don't think, looking back on it, but just a great guy and very encouraging. You know, a lot of coaches are just inspirational. And I, I think most of the coaches I had were mostly inspirational. The ones that had technique, when I look back on them, I'm like, Phew. how do I even became a player with that, <laughs> with that technique is amazing to me. I had to unlearn most of it. But, yeah, I guess Peter Chang, uh, he was the club pro. And in so terms of... Go ahead. Go ahead. Now you go ahead. And in terms of like really understanding the game, you know, you say you kind of like had to unlearn everything. Like I know what you're talking about, but would you say that when you're taught things in tennis, especially just because like there's so many things that can go wrong when you tell a player to like get his racket back early or use a lot of wrist or move your feet. Like there's so many things that could go wrong on the other part of the stroke. But I mean, you always have, you always have something to say in terms of like simplifying the stroke, right? Well, it's, it's more of a, you know, most tennis instruction are just tips. That's all they are, tips and drills. In fact, they even brag about it. You know, here's my tip of the week, tip of the day. And, um, you know, you worked with me for three or four years. I mean, uh, ours is about a philosophy, right? I mean, ours is a philosophy, the same philosophy that people use those ropes in the gym. You know, they go like this and they use those heavy ropes to work out with those ropes are making a sine wave, right? And that's how they get their exercise deep in their core. Well, that's the same philosophy I use, that, sign, that, that idea of a sine wave with the racket. So instead of treating the racket like a, like a linear flat object, you learn, to, you, know, you learn to move it like you would move a rope. And, and so you use your core to do a little figure eight, and then the arm sort of plays a sine wave off that figure eight and you absorb the hit with your whole body. So mine's not really a, like 70 or 80 tips strung together. It's really a philosophy. And then you build the game around that philosophy. So just in talking about uh, the figure eight, can you kind of explain that a little bit more by what you mean? You know, like in sure. terms of moving your whole body in a figure eight? Sure, sure. Basically a small figure eight in the hips creates a larger figure eight out in your arms and legs. So a figure eight is used by skiers or snowboarders. It's used by surfers. Uh, so that's the leg part. And then uh, the arm part of figure eight is used in a great volleyball serve. Uh, swimmers use a figure eight in their core that extends out to their arms. And then they have that motion, right? That nonlinear motion. So, yeah. So basically a small figure eight in your hips creates, you know, all this dynamic in the rest of your body. And would, is that the reason why you'd say, like, uh, kids who start younger in tennis, even if they don't have the best coaching, they're at an advantage? They, I think kids that start younger, I think they make it despite their coaching. You know, the coach is telling them to get their racket back or do a unit turn or whatever, you know, whatever the buzzword is this year. But the kid, the racket's so big in the kid's hand, it's so heavy for a four-year-old that when they, you know, it takes their whole body 
to, and, and they, they have that figure eight unconsciously or intuitively. So, yeah, so, so it takes so much to wield the racket back and forth. It's that little figure eight in the hips. You know, the figure eight is the first move you make when you're a baby. I mean, that's how you roll over in your crib. You know, you, you, either way, you roll over to your front side or roll over to your back side. It's by wiggling your hips in a figure eight until you get the momentum to roll over. And then crawling, of course, is also a figure eight in your hips and you keep catching your balance with your hands. So you're not just, you know, you're not a muscle bound little two month old, just moving your arms around. You're just wiggling your hips, catching your balance with your hands in front of you. So, so yeah, you know, tennis is a special yeah. sport that way. And the figure eight, you'd say, starts in the core, though, right? Always. Starts okay. in the core. You'll hear a lot of pros talk about, or even the commentators talk about, you know, shoulder rotation. But that's hardly the center of your body. So they just, what the problem is, most people, they see something, and, they, they, and whatever is the most dynamic thing that they see, like if they see the racket moving fast, they'll go, oh, use racket head speed. Or if they see the shoulders moving fast, well, rotate your shoulders. But it's not always what you see in sports. It's what you don't see. And I think what you don't see is that this is pretty much just observational teaching. Like if they see the racket moving fast, they tell you to swing your racket fast. Or if it's the shoulders, you know, if that's all they see is the wild movement of the shoulders, well, rotate your shoulders. But uh, like I said earlier, the hips is the center of your body. That's your core. So really, as goes your hips, you know, so goes the rest of your body. So you have to initiate everything in the core. I don't care if you're throwing a punch, you know, in, in Tai Chi or, or uh, one of the martial arts, or if you're playing tennis, it really all comes from the core. So and Jack, um, you talk about, philosophy. yeah, you talk about um, the figure eight being super important in the game of tennis. Also, one thing that I, you, were, you harped on, you know, in terms of when I was on the court for sure, was the 45 degree angle and how, the 45 degree angle can really be found in all sports and kind of everything related in terms of like the figure eight. So talk a little bit about the 45 degree angle and how it just relates to life in general, you know? Yeah. The 45 is, is really a fascinating thing because uh, it obviously bisects the vertical axis and the horizontal, right? The horizontal goes this way, the vertical that way. And what bisects the two of them perfectly equally, which is what bisects means uh, is the 45 degree angle. Right. So if, if you watch a golfer, he always puts that golf ball just above. He doesn't put it in between his legs. He puts it just, you know, just a little above that to the 45 degree angle. Or if you watch a great basketball player shooting a free throw, they don't put their toes on the line, right? Their, their back foot, their left foot, let's say, if they're a righty, if they're shooting right handed, is always back three or four inches, poising their body and their hips at the 45 degree angle. And then they shoot the ball from there. And, and even in science, I mean, the 45 degree angle, that's what, that's what, that's the mirror, the angle of the mirror in a telescope. So, I mean, the 45 de degree angle is iconic and it's funny, you know, sports, unfortunately, is sometimes just taught by dumb jocks, right? A tennis player gets good and then oh, I'll teach it, but they really never learn very much other than hard work. And they had maybe a, a natural that they have something natural for the game. It's really hard to impart that on someone who wants to play the game, but isn't a natural athlete or isn't going to put in thousands of hours. So the idea of the 45 degree angle is huge because if you just line up at the 45 degree angle to the net, it makes hitting them. I mean, that gives you your hitting point uh, forehand or backhand or serve or volley. So it gives you your optimal hitting point. So it's crucial. It's crucial. And you see it in baseball. You see it in all sports. But unfortunately, like the figure eight, nobody talks about it. And, and it would open up the sport, all these sports, to so many more people if they knew some of these um, special principles, you know, fundamentals. So when tennis coaches refer to hitting the ball out in front, you'd say, like, that's completely wrong? That's not even a place? It's not even, I mean, it's, it's a place if you're a natural athlete, they'll go, yeah, sure, coach, I get it, uh, you know, but, but if you're not a natural athlete, out in front of you could be way too far in front of you where you end up pushing the ball or hitting it in the net. Uh, you know, uh, I say hit it out in front of you, but make sure the front of you is facing the 45-degree angle. Then it's directly in front of you. So that gives you an exact place to hit the ball. 
And I think that's what people need. They really need a blueprint to play a game like tennis or else they feel like, like I said earlier, that you have to play every day of the week, you know, two, three hours a day. And it's just not true. You don't. I mean, I go out there now when I'm not coaching, I still play a lot and I might play once or twice a week, but I don't feel like I get rusty. And you know, you're playing after college, right? And, and you can use your intellect to help you uh, find your game. And then once you find it, then feel kicks in. But uh, you're the best example of anyone, T Money, because you know you were you were having a rough time in the boys' fourteen and unders, and then all of a sudden we're winning tournaments in the boys' sixteen and unders. So the principles are really, you know, you're living proof uh, of anybody. I would say I would say you're you're like the perfect guy to talk about because you're a good athlete, but like me, you're not a natural athlete. Neither of us are Michael Jordan types. You know, you can't just stick any instrument in our hand any basketball baseball and we're going to be the best out there like a natural athlete and and uh, those principles took you really quickly if i remember within a year took you from being early round loser to being a real winner yeah playing for, for playing for uconn i don't know if your audience knows that but you played for uconn varsity tennis that's pretty impressive for a guy you know when i met you at 14 you were trying to decide whether you even want to keep playing tennis because you know Tennis is a real beast of burden, right? It's a, it's a, most people that play tennis have a love hate with tennis. And uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to get over for people. And, and uh, so they don't have to quit and go to pickleball, you know, so they can enjoy a sport where you run a little bit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Jack, it's, it's crazy to just think and like hear the way you talk about tennis in such a simple form, like, you know, if you hear somebody who's been around the game of tennis for so long, you'd figure that they'd need like 30 talking points. Okay, first do this, first do this, first do this. When you talk to you about tennis, man, it just seems so simple. And like, guys, it really is like when you think about tennis in these two ways, it really does become so much easier. You know, if you stand in the middle of the court back by the baseline and you line your belly button up to the right net post or you line your belly button up to the left net post that's your hitting point you know that's like, correct. without 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 all this like racket back early follow through wrist exactly all this stuff it just makes it like such an easier way to think about the game when you um even, even if you like read jack's book jack can you shout out the first book you wrote about like what was it 20 years ago well my yeah my most recent book is the one that i prefer because uh, i flushed through a lot of things um, I wrote a book called The Secrets of the Natural Athlete, and, and um, that's where I showed lots of different sports. But my newest book is just basically called The Three Core Fundamentals of Nonlinear Tennis. And when I say nonlinear, that's what I mean. There's, it's all curves. There's no straight lines. There's no put your, you know, the point the butt of your racket here. Do this with your arm. It's more of how does the figure eight in your hips create this beautiful sine wave in your arm? And if you line that up to the 45 degree angle, that's pretty much all you need to know. And uh, same with the serve. I mean, people have a lot of trouble with the serve, but it's so easy. I, I, I think you've seen my, my course where I give a lesson in real time. Uh, I did a course several years ago with a guy who never hit a serve before. And within 20, 25 minutes, he was hitting, you know, nice 35, 40 miles an hour, and he wasn't missing. He, I think he hit like seven in a row on camera, and the guy had never served before. So really, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, it's sad to see so many sports get pushed to the side for walking or jogging or, you know, pickleball, like I said, something that's so easy. Uh, when sports is really especially tennis tennis is like the king of sports because you got the backhand and the forehand and it's just it's a sad thing for me to see people leaving these beautiful sports where you get great exercise like you told me earlier today you said you're still playing a couple times a week so it, tennis is still a big deal for you and it, it should be the sport of a lifetime but so often um, people play in high school and then they you know once they uh, get out of college they're like, you know what, you know, I have to play too much. I'm going to take up something different because this is too difficult. And it's really not. I mean, tennis really is easy and should be easy. And to learn it, it's really quite simple and a lot of fun. 
No, you know? I, to- I totally agree, man. And I think it also comes to a point where people are just like, this is just too difficult for me to come out here once a month, struggle, be upset with myself. And like, what, this happens every time? You know, I was a, whatever it may be, I was a solid player in high school, but now I'm just not on the court as much as, you know, I need to be. When in actuality, if you really have a couple things that you're thinking about on the tennis court, and it's not so complex, you know, you'll have a fun time and you'll be able to hit the ball back with your partner. You know what I mean? Exactly. And you see the figure eight and everything also. I mean, think about a baseball player that, right? I've got the phone here, so let me put it there. But a baseball player, right? Don't they waggle in that figure eight in their hips and then their, the, the bat waggles up here in that same figure eight? They're, they're, you know, the great athletes, they intuitively know of the things that you and I, you know, worked on years ago and, and the way I teach tennis, most athletes intuitively know it. Even golfers, you see before they hit, they kind of wiggle around and all athletes do that, right? They, they have this intuitive, this, this, this unconscious knowing of a figure eight in their body. And, and it's, it's really important. And it's funny because you see it in other things, you see it in dance, martial arts they talk about it in all in, in those types of things they talk about the figure eight and dance and the figure eight and martial arts but unfortunately in softball and tennis they don't talk about it so most people don't want to play sports because of the h factor right they're all afraid of being humiliated especially tennis right? yeah, tennis is get- definitely one you know if you got two people out there who don't you know can't find a, a blind squirrel can't even find a nut you know it's tough yep or if you're playing doubles and you double fault every time, I mean, that's no fun. You, you just feel terrible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, cause you ruin the game for three other people. So, you know, the humiliation factor is such a big deal in sports. I think that it pushes people away from sports. I keep using that pickleball example because there's a sport that's like a participation trophy. All you got to do really is stand there and kind of, you know, hit the ball. You don't have to run. <laughs> you don't have to be in great shape. And you just kind of give it a tap. And I think it's nice if people want to get outdoors. Sure. If you want to have a drinking game, that's great. You know, that'd be about the only way I would play it (laughs) is if I had a keg. But, uh, you know, like I said, tennis is such a great sport and so much fun. And people that do play it love it. But it's, it's turning into a cult sport because I think because of the humiliation factor. People just think if I don't play all the time, I'm not going to be good. And that's just, it's just not true. And you know that because you're playing a couple times a week and you're still loving, you tell me you're, you're cranking on the ball, you're roping it. So, and I believe you, I saw you on their video the other day. This guy looks good. Watch his tennis. Forget Let's go, man. Comedy. Jack, I, re- I really can't, Forget dude. Forget the I... comedy. Good. What are you doing? Forget the comedy. Play tennis. <laughs> dude, I can't thank you enough. There's so many times that I almost wanted to kill you on the tennis court, but you really... <laughs> You've really taught me so much in life and especially on the tennis court. And I can't thank you enough. But, you know, before we um, get to our last few topics here in working with, you know, top players, guys like Albert Ramos, Sam Query, Stevie Johnson and, you know, other players on tour. Yeah. Do you see the game improving each year? Do you see like your the way you look at tennis fundamentally kind of trickling down into these new players? Because it seems like to me that a lot more players have every shot kind of these days you know it's not like an Andy Roddick one big serve and then this point's kind of over you know what I mean well you're right and you're right and and maybe you're wrong I mean you're definitely right about the big three I mean we all know Djokovic Nadal and Federer everybody knows those three and yes they have all court games and they are complete players Um, but you know in bringing up the next group we haven't, those three are still dominating two straight decades. Crazy. Those three guys are still dominating. They dominated at 19 and 20. I miss and Andy Murray, by the 30. way. I really miss Andy Murray. You know, I love So him. do I. You know, I do. When I say the big three, I, I, in my heart, I'm thinking the big four. I wish I could say <laughs> the big four. <laughs> yeah. Because, but Andy's back. Look, he won a few rounds at Wimbledon. He won three rounds. That was pretty impressive. He beat the 30th seed. So maybe he's not done. But, you know, once you have surgery, it's not quite quite the same at that high level so I hope everyone continues getting that big game you see the Americans have a lot of trouble we're not even in the top 30 in the men's right now and I think that's because they don't have complete games you know the American men just seem to have trouble with their backhands 
And when you got guys like Nadal and Federer who are equal on both sides and they can volley and they've got great serves, it's going to be tough to get an American man back in that top 10. Forget, you know, I mean, right now we want to get in the top 30. Um, and the women, I, you know, the women, uh, I, I don't know who my favorite woman is uh, right now because we, I don't think we've seen our Federer, Djokovic, Nadal. Maybe Serena, in a way, she's a competitor, but she doesn't make the game look effortless. She makes it look difficult. And let's face it, she has the biggest and best serve on tour. I think I heard she just retired, so she might not be on tour, but she for sure had the best serve on tour, and that was what she dominated with. So I don't think we've seen our best woman yet. Um, for me, Justine Hennon might have been the best woman ever because she was only five foot six. So pound for pound, she was an incredible, and she used to beat the pants off the Williams sisters. So pound for pound, she was probably the best player, but unfortunately she had her own issues, personal issues. So she left the game. So I don't know if, if everyone's taking, I would imagine a lot of people are watching Fed and Djokovic now that are young, um, but I don't know if they're necessarily Americans, but um, we still seem to like the big serve and the big forehand here and everything else we sort of shy away from. So, uh, but certainly those three guys, I think tennis, this is the golden age of t men's tennis right now. There's no question. Um, I hope more people watch because watching a guy like Federer, you might might only be one or two more times he plays. You know, he's getting yeah. he's getting up I, there. I know. Yeah. Like if you if you asked me three years ago, you know, when Federer was going to retire, I would have every Grand Slam, I'd be like, oh, this could be the last one. This could be the last one. You know, and I hope something like Djokovic winning more Grand Slams like than Federer doesn't happen. But it seems like it's almost inevitable right now with all three of those guys having twenty Grand Slams. Do you agree? It is. I predict he's going to win the Golden Slam, meaning he's going to win the Olympic gold, and he's going to win the four slams. Uh, I'll, I'll go on record. I don't see anyone beating him right now unless something drastic happens, like an injury or a bad fall. Um, but, yeah, no, we have to watch the last little bit of Roger Federer. But, you know, it's funny, these guys, I was just thinking about it while I'm chatting with you. It's kind of like Michael Jordan and Kobe. The guys that have the beautiful games, the effortless games, they just want to keep playing. Like, look at Roddick. He got out of the game at 26. All he had was that big serve, and we all know it. Right? That's what he had. That was, that was his game, the big serve. Backhand, so-so. Forehand had its moments, but nothing particular. Couldn't volley, save his life. Um, but he quits at 26. Knowing, was, he that, well, was he that young, Jack? I'm going to fact check you there, but go ahead. Yeah, fact check me on that. I believe he got out of the game at 26. Very young, very young. Uh, but look at Federer and Nadal and Djokovic. They want to play forever, kind of like Kobe did, kind of like Michael Jordan did. You know, it's just so much fun for them to play. It's, it's, it's recreational. Even though they make a fortune on it, it's recreational. And I think when you have that awkward game, it makes you want to play the game forever, which is kind of why I really push uh, – these fundamentals of mine, the, the figure eight, the 45, and that sine wave in your, in your arm, in your body, your arm and legs. Because once you know those tricks, once you know those fundamentals, I, I, Teddy, I think you'll be playing for the rest of your life. I mean, I, I can see that. And I know I will be, look, my, <laughs> I mean, it almost is the rest of my life. You know? And I'm still, I'm still dinging the ball. I'm playing singles, you know, given lots of tennis clinics all over the world. And, but uh, I love playing. I love playing too. You know, it's not just about money. It's not just about teaching. I just, I have to get out there and hit the ball a couple times a week because it's just so much fun. And I think that's the big difference with the guys who have these all court games you're talking about. I think they just love hitting the ball. And, and it's not a business like Rafter left the game early, 26, 27, right in there. Roddick left the game early. I think the guys with one big shot. It's, it's, it's making a living. And once yeah. they see they can't make a living anymore, they're like, okay, I'm done. I'll do something else. But yeah. the real players, the guys that have it all, it's just too much fun to quit. I, I just don't know. I don't see – every time Rogers asks, he says, nah, nothing in the future. I don't, I don't see myself quitting anytime soon. I don't think he'll care if he's ranked 20 in the world. Yeah, and, and it's, it's funny you mention that. Like, I remember 
I guess like even 10 years ago, it was normal. By the way, Roddick retired at 30 years old, uh, by the way. 30? So, like, yeah, so. Right. I, mean, I knew it was young. I, I right. thought it was younger. But the thing is, like 10 years ago, I mean, that was the normal age to kind of retire from tennis and sports, right? 30. And now you're seeing guys like Leo Messi in soccer. You're seeing old ass baseball players. I can't even name one in particular, but guys who are playing to the mid 40s, even pitching to, to, in, to their 50 guys who have been playing golf, they've always been playing for a long time, you know, like yeah. maybe it's not as strenuous, but they're always moving from their hips. You have to That's move right. from your hips in golf. Like you can't fake a big uh, drive in golf and then, you know, you chip and can't putt, you know, you have to have the complete game in golf. And that's kind of the same for tennis. You know, we're seeing an older generation. So these guys who are 23, 24, 25, they can't hack with these older guys. You know, the game is not as young as it used to be, you know? I, I agree. You know, T, it's funny. You're, I was just thinking, listening to you, I, I, I think you might be your own genre. The comedian tennis player. I don't think we've ever had one. Dude, of them. and the freaking rapper, too, bro. Come on, son. Oh, okay, money. That's why we always called you T Money. <laughs> oh, that's money. <laughs> exactly, man. No, well, you're yeah, right. No, you're nobody's, nobody's doing what we're doing over here, man. <laughs> Who's your favorite player right now on the men's side? And women's side, and then a tip for somebody who is looking to get more serious in tennis, you know, being able to have fun on the court. Um, favorite on the men's side. Well, uh, it's, it's still so tough because my favorite personality-wise is Roger. I just, I just think he's a class act. Uh, and, and Djokovic has had his moments uh, personality-wise, but I don't see how you can – go with anybody if you're going to put money on the on the match i'm going to have to put money on uh, on djokovic now i think he's the best player in the world yeah um so i don't know if he's my favorite player but, but i think he's the best player in the world i love you know everything he does out there and certainly he, he fits the three fu core fundamentals if you watch him play through my eyes you see every ball he contacts is at the 45 he's always facing the 45 he pulls his hand in he kicks his foot back he does whatever it takes to stay at the 45 and you see the nice rotation in his hips. So, I mean, he's, he's become a poster boy. Roger was always my poster boy. But they all are. I mean, if you watch him carefully, you see they all, they all do the same. The essence of their game is the same thing. It's that 45-degree angle, the figure eight, and the arm coming out more like a rope than a racket. Uh, the women's side, um, don't have a favorite right now. I, I've thought about that quite a bit. I don't have a favorite because... Barty's the first one to be the number one. You, I was going to ask you about Barty. She's the first one to be the number one seed and win the tournament. I haven't seen that in about five, six, seven years. <laughs> the number one seed, because I just don't think there's a dominant force in the women's game. Um, the number one seed almost always loses early, not not just in the finals. They lose early. Barty's the first one I can remember. I wrote an article recently on that. She's the first woman player I can remember that actually held her seed. Um, I don't know if she's dominant right now. Uh, certainly she doesn't have Serena's serve. Uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting at bay. We'll do it again in a year or two. But uh, I'm waiting at bay to see what woman comes out with the effortless game, the big serve. You know, there's lots of women I've liked. Uh, Davenport had the great backhand. Hennon had the great volleys, and, and she pretty much was great at everything. Serena has the incomparable serve. I mean, in incredible incredible serve um and then uh, what was the last question i guess tips i don't really give tips but no, philosophy. No, no, not, i mean just you know if you had i mean you know not the actual tips where you're like you know racket head speed and shit like that but right I mean, just someone you know to think about one thing when in, in terms of tennis well i i would say honestly anyone wanting to get into the game should go check out the website and, and the free book i mean it's a 20 minute read but it has lots of pictures where you get to see all these athletes at the 45 and you'll realize, wow, it's not that hard. If I just do a few little things, right. A few fundamentals, you know, that like, you know, fundamentals like the 45 and gravity, you know, things you can't really get away from. If you just do a few little things, right. The game can be very easy and you can have fun pretty much right away. I mean, I've taken lots of beginners that have never played. And after their hour lesson, they're on the court the rest of the day. And they're out there the rest of the week and they're really loving their tennis. So uh, that would be my big suggestion because if you go to YouTube, all you're going to get is racket head speed, unit turn, all that stuff. 
and it's free and um, you know you pretty much get what you pay for so it's not going to really uh, do much for your game so that would be my my only advice is just go to brody tennis or nonlinear tennis.com guys brody tennis and, we're going uh, to just... put that we're going to put that link by the way in the youtube description here spotify description and apple podcast description seriously jack knows his shit but jack i wanted to also ask you man what is the what does the future of tennis look like, man? I know I feel like I know so much about the game that I could go toe to toe with honestly anyone in the entire world and talk t- tennis intelligently and I teach, agree. and teach a beginner maybe more so than a guy who's top ten in the world because I can I can see it from a different place that I'm not just 100%. like number 100%. ten in the world, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm 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 a little worried about tennis. Um, because um, in the United States, it seems to be becoming a cult sport almost. I mean, more people are picking up the other racket sports than they are tennis. But it's, it's once again goes back to what I was saying. People are intimidated by tennis, and they shouldn't be. Because, you know, especially if you want to get some exercise, tennis is by far the best of the sports to get exercise in. Um, you know, in an hour, you can just, you know, really break a sweat and have a great time. It would take you you know, at least a whole afternoon of golf to get that or, you know, three or four hours of pickleball or paddle tennis or one of those other racket sports, it would take forever to get that kind of exercise. Um, so I'm a little bit worried about the game. Uh, I, certainly in Spain and France and Russia, tennis is hot, hot, hot. <laughs> so let's see what happens in this country. I don't know. Um, but I certainly hope, I, I certainly think um, with the guys you named off earlier, I've coached my share of top uh, world ranked players. And I really think that if people would just sort of uh, be open minded and look into something other than, you know, you know, I'm, you know, work hard, work hard and play hard, you know, if they just used a little bit of intellect, I think uh, it could save the game of tennis, uh, you know, everywhere. So I really do encourage people to play tennis. I encourage you to come to the website or read the book because you'll be blown away. You'll be blown away. And, and Teddy's right. He does know probably more about the game than, than most people, uh, than most tennis pros. There's no question about that. Um, but T Money, I did just think of one great thing. Did you ever tell anybody about your surfing story? No. What? Somebody asked me if I had surfed ever, day, ever the other day, and I said, no, not really. What's well, the yeah, surfing you story? you did. Don't What's you remember sur- just trying to get in the wetsuit? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> I, I, when I was with Jack, this is probably 10 years, more than 10 years ago. This is like 15 years ago. I was in San Diego with Jack. Jack's from San Diego. And I put on the wetsuit backwards. It was the best day of my life. <laughs> I was just, oh, I love it. Dude, the thing was, it didn't even look like it was backwards to me. I was like, all right, my ass goes where my balls go. All right, we'll figure this out. <laughs> I was like, money, that, that's great. I said, but you got it on backwards. But you made it out in the water. I do remember you made it out in the water. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how good it was that day. I kind of forget. I got lost after the after the wetsuit. I, I, I pretty much lost it. That's when I knew you were going to be a stand-up comic. L- literally that moment. <laughs> Dude, I prefer you on the tennis court, man. And you did show me to my first In-N-Out burger with those animal fries. Oh, that's true. That's true. We've had some fun together, and uh, not many people got to know this guy when he was 14, 15, 16, 17 in that area right there, but I did. Yeah, and uh, I should have seen this coming. I should have seen it coming. Yeah, man. Jack Brody, ladies and gentlemen, guys, click that link in the Instagram bio. Seriously, if you want to even learn a little bit how to play tennis or just to think about sports in general, it's really going to be a great read, and you will not regret it. Jack Brody. One, one thing I should have yeah. told you, we got all these tools now. You know about the eight board, right? Yeah, of course. Go oh, ahead. I have about five or six more patents that make the game easier. Uh, things that you rotate on, swivels, things that rock. Uh, I've got a thing you hold in your hand. Uh, it's the size of a racket, but it's a different shape. So it teaches you to watch the ball better, see the ball better, I should say. Okay. So I forgot to tell you about that, T, because you, you should go check it out. You'd love this stuff. Maybe I'll give you, send you a picture. You can put it up with the, with the podcast. But Absolutely, these uh, products, they're very, they're very unusual. Very unusual. I'd love to, man. That'd be great. Dude. Yeah. So, Jack, um, b- before we get out of here, man, you got anything else or what? No, no, that's, that's Biggie. I- Jack Brody, you are the freaking man, dude. And um, we'll see you in New York soon, okay, man? 
I hope so. I love you, T. Thank you so much, man. Love you too. Peace. Peace.